Hello everyone. Hello, hello, and welcome. Yeah, Dr. Alice is here. Uh, Prof. Nivedita also here, and I believe I can see uh, Prof. Afrilino. Yes. Okay. I think we are about to start within uh, one minute, so we shall wait for other audience to join in first. Morning, afternoon to all. Uh, Prof. Afrilino. Apa kabar, Bapak? Alhamdulillah, baik Ibu. Ya, Terima kasih. Kali, ya, ya, kali pertama jumpa Prof ya. Ya. And and we have also Prof uh, Nivet. Okay, your, your name is very long. I hope I could call you Prof Nivet. Yeah. Nivet Dita, yes. Nivet Dita. Nivet Dita. Okay, and we have Prof Gayatri and Prof Sam also. Yeah, from, from Sati. Okay, good morning to all. Good morning, everyone. It's afternoon or morning in India? I'm not sure. It, it's morning. Oh, it's morning. Okay. It's it's ten, right? It's ten in the morning, right? In India. Nine thirty. It's nine thirty. Okay, good. Uh, Bapa Afriliano, kenalkan ya. Ini Prof Gayatri, uh, Prof Nivedita, dan juga Prof Sam from Sasi Creative School, India dari India. I see, I see. Is it in Chennai? Is it in Chennai? Prof Nivedita, or is it in Tamil Nadu? In Tamil Nadu, Coimbatore. 
Okay. All right. For the others, okay, uh, Doctor Isaac. Shall we wait a little bit more? Yeah, because sure. we are already at twelve. Uh, it's okay. We shall wait like uh one or two minutes for the other to join. How are you, Prof Sam? Is everything all right? <laughs> Is your mic working? <laughs> we can hear you. Yeah, I mean, I'm fine, uh, Prof Isaac. I mean, uh -huh. how are you doing? Yeah, great, great. It's been great here. Great. We can Hi. move around finally. <laughs> oh yeah, right. Yeah, we can move around. Yes. We are not bound to our home. <laughs> so all the restrictions have been taken off. Uh, kind of, yeah. But we still have to adhere to uh, strict uh, SOPs, basically. Okay. Yeah. All right, all right. But uh, what's important is that we can move around freely. <laughs> much, much better. Much, much better, yes. Right. Uh, hi, Prof. Alice. Hi, hi, Prof. Sam. I'll be seeing you again soon, I think, this week, right? In exactly. Yes. It's, it's, it's Thursday, yes. It's Thursday for, for another yeah. discussion. Yes. Right. Um, I think it's it's very fortunate today because we have uh, three countries actually we have from Indonesia and I hope uh, there'll be students and colleagues from uh, Universitas Tanjung Pura right Prof Afiliano will be joining in uh, and also we have a team from India and also uh, a team from UTM also from Malaysia so there'll be three cultures this discussing about architecture uh, today. And also, we we see a different three perspective uh, from three different countries. So I think that's be very good. Uh, this international webinar series. So there'll be more to come. I think uh, in one week's time, also we have uh, some more from Sasi, right? I think it's Prof yes. Gaya three next. <laughs> yeah, discussing on housing. Yes, Alice. Yeah. Yes. yes. So it's, it's it's good. So um, housing in in um. Kalimantan, Prof. Afiliano, is it still uh, under COVID or is it uh, everyone moves freely in, in Kalimantan now? Uh, no, they, I think it's uh, in a better situation because uh, there's uh, no more restriction in the flying from the Kalimantan to the other, uh, the, the other maybe like Jakarta, but uh, the rest of the patient, it's Make a little worries for us to to make a travel, <laughs> okay. but the thing is not 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 not, uh, not not too far from here now. Yeah, yeah, it's not that strict now. I think Malaysia yeah. is also uh, lifting up the borders to allow the uh, international visitors to come in also. So yes. so I hope by by next semester it can mm -hmm. be face to face for for all of us. So I actually, so. yeah, actually, I'm I'm actually looking forward to have a team from Indonesia to come and visit us, and also team from India to come and visit us, for for the planning in 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 February or March. So I think that'd be great for the for the three schools here today. Okay, Doctor, is it? What do you think? Uh, we have about hundred and thirty five participants now, and I can yep. see a lot of um names here in the in the chat box and also in the list. Mm -hmm. I think we can start now. Yeah, sure. All right. No worries. Okay. Okay. I think we are starting now. Uh, first thing first, I would like to say uh, good afternoon. Okay. Uh, and good morning. Good day to everybody in this webinar. So we are honored to have you all here, the esteemed speakers and a valuable audience. Welcome to International Webinar Series 2, organized by uh, Architecture Program at University Technology Malaysia. For your information, this is our uh, second international webinar series after our first one in the last week together with the SASI Creative School of Architecture in India. And for this webinar series, it is more special in a way that we have three architecture school from three different countries to collab and disseminate knowledge to the audience present here. And with that, let me bid a uh, sincere welcome to SASI Creative School of Architecture India and Architecture Program Universitas Tanjung Pura Indonesia. And not to forget the audience uh, to the webinar series today, not only from uh, the India and Indonesia, I guess, but potentially all over the world. We welcome you with open heart and thank you for joining our international webinar series too. And uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Dr. Isaac. I think most of you are already uh, familiar with me uh, from University Technology Malaysia. 
I'll be responsible for hosting the session today, and I'm glad to welcome our first speaker uh, for this webinar series, Professor Nivedita, who is an assistant professor from Sasi Creative School of Architecture, who will be talking about cultural expressions in architecture uh, within Tamil Nadu context. And our second speaker from University Technology Malaysia, Associate Professor Dr. Ali Sabrina Ismail, a director for the architecture program here, who will be talking about contestation of power in architecture for the search of Malaysian national identity. And our third speaker, Professor Afrilino, who is an assistant professor from Universitas Tanjung Pura, Indonesia, uh, who will be talking about rethinking architecture and urbanism through public space in West Kalimantan, Indonesia. Uh, for the viewers uh, for this, uh, of this webinar, I will attach the link to attendance uh, form in the chat box somewhere towards the end of the session. And uh, please be noted that since this webinar series is allocated under Online Global Classroom, OGC, we'll, we will provide two links for the attendance, one for the students, both local and international, and another one for the general attendance that will get you an each certificate once you fill it in. And uh, please take note for each speaker time, the time allocated for each talk is 25 minutes and we are going to start with our speaker number one, followed by speaker number two and finally with speaker number three chronologically. And subsequently, we are going to have another 25 minutes uh, Q&A session with the speakers. So audience are free to ask questions during this period. And should you have any question during the talk, please drop your question in the chat section at the bottom right corner of the Webex, Webex window for me to collect and bring it forward during the Q&A session afterwards. All right, so uh, without further ado, I shall welcome our first speaker of the session, Professor Nivedita uh, from Sasi Creative School of Architecture with the title, Cultural Expression in Architecture within Tamil Nadu, India Context. Tamil Nadu carries a long history, cultural values and rich heritage seamlessly connected the culture with the built environment. So the discourse is basically about how two components between architecture and social culture are able to bond with each other uh, to carry the identity of the people and place. With this, I give this room to Prof Nivedita to take over. And uh, Prof, the room is yours. Thank you, thank you. I'm just sharing. Am I audible now? Yes, we can hear you clearly. And visible? Presentation is? Yep, all good. Prof. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, um, Professor Isik. So, um, so the topic today, as uh, Professor said, it's cultural expressions in architecture within the context of uh, Tamil Nadu. So, um, as you all know, we are, I am from uh, India, Tamil Nadu, and with an intention to uh, bring to you a glimpse of uh, the history, culture, and unique things of uh, Tamil Nadu through its architecture, uh, I basically wanted to share the traditional architecture which i can say uh, was always strongly dictated by culture now uh, why are we even talking about uh, culture so culture as we know is can be defined as all the ideas customs and the social behavior of a particular uh, society of people so uh, architecture and culture has always been uh, interwoven the dialogue has always helped holding the integrity of the society and of course uh, maintaining the identity uh, for me it has always been intriguing and uh, interesting to observe the quirks and peculiarities of uh, architecture of the different places and um, the objectives behind them and what makes it interesting so i hope that is interesting to you as well uh, so since we are uh, talking about Tamil Nadu, let me just give a small introduction about uh, uh, Tamil Nadu. So basically, uh, considering um, India, Tamil Nadu is in the southernmost uh, tip in the Indian Peninsula, and uh, it has a geographical positioning such that it has uh, varied features, uh, uh, physical features from all the five mountain ranges, coastal areas, plains, forests, and drylands. So because of which the climatic type also uh, is different from place to place. Uh, and taking you through a glimpse of history, uh, it's, 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 it's said to have a recorded history almost uh, from the fourth century uh, BC. 
and uh, because of its close uh, proximity to uh, the sea, trade links uh, were developed, and uh, even with ancient Greece and uh, Rome. So uh, the strategic positioning of it allowed for a lot of political supremacy. And uh, between uh, 350 and uh, 80 BC and 300 AD, uh, it was uh, ruled by the uh, famous Cholas, Cheras, and Pandya dynasty and uh, Pallava dynasty. And slowly um, it was uh, taken over, continued after 550 and 850. So I, and once. Uh, after 1800 uh, AD, there is, uh, uh, I'm sorry, so there is, uh, there was all this colonial invasion and uh, British invasion and then uh, industrialization toward industrialization to, and now we are here. So I will be particularly talking about a few uh, examples from between these uh, Sangam era, which I call it, which we, which we call it, and then uh, Pallavas and Pandyas, where the cultural roots were uh, strong before any uh, invasions uh, happened. Now, talking about the uh, cult general culture and uh, belief systems of uh, Tamil Nadu, right? So right now it exists with a large cultural uh, mix, uh, but then the cultural roots were very strongly based on the religion uh, and the lifestyle, which uh, we call Hinduism. And it still continues in different, uh, still continues in different layers, uh, along with now uh, all, a lot of different religions coexisting. Uh, so now in, with all the extensive uh, uh, developments in architecture over the period, like I said, I will be, uh, touching on the rich vernacular architecture that originated before industrialization, uh, which exists as great examples uh, to have intertwined both culture and built environment. So I'll take you through a few um, unique standing examples on different scales. Uh, this will be like a short uh, rendition of uh, Tamil Nadu, and I hope uh, I can make justice to it. So uh, the three things that we will be talking about are uh, Temple towns, Agraharams, and Chetinadu Vidu. So I will uh, explain what each one of it is. So uh, starting from uh, temple towns, so uh, these like these are old ancient cities which uh, exist even now, and something which uh, one cannot look away from. So uh, these are urban settlements that evolved during the six and ninth uh, century and as as expansions as agrarian uh, expansion so a few uh, like these are places where there are many examples and i will be talking about one particular example called madurai and so a few images to show you uh, before i get into the particular example on uh, what we are going to discuss about so uh, this is a city called sri rangam uh, and this is the city of Madurai. There's also Sri Rangam. And uh, these are the uh, main temples uh, and the city aerial views for you to get a understanding of what it is. And so now, uh, so owing to all uh, the spread of all, uh, during this period of time, there was a Quranic religions that played a central role in the lifestyle of the uh, South Indians and the economy also was interconnected to it. Basically, temples were a core uh, of core importance during this period of time. Now, uh, the temples even, like I said, worked as uh, banks to cater to the farmers and the trading communities and religious activities took a dominant role in shaping the environment. Now, uh, the these are few aerial images showing the similar uh, the, the towns that I had shown before. Uh, there are basically two. I can we can categorize into two different kinds of uh, towns: uh, monocentric and uh, multifocal. Now, uh, what happens here is these towns were developed the like because of the cultural requirement where the temples were forming the main uh, element. The temples were in the center. And all the uh, activities and um, uh, requirements were planned around it. 
so even the planning of the city uh, took uh, almost like a grid uh, form and they they had concentric streets around them uh, which uh, uh, which went with uh, certain importance according to the relationship to the temple they they were arranged with certain distance from the temple and then there were perpendicular streets which were um, which were like um, the uh, extra like um, smaller streets that would connect to the temples so these are aerial images of three different uh, monocentric towns when i say monocentric it's basically one temple uh, which had the focus in the complete uh, town so all these three have you can see the similarities in the layout and how the street uh, uh, streets are concentric um, and it has developed around that now uh, this is an, another image to show you how uh, multifocal town of this is kanchipuram in tamil nadu uh, in this case this similar scenario existed but with multiple uh, temples now uh, i thought we can go into madurai as a particular example now this uh, madurai em emerged during pandyan dynasty in uh, 550 uh, so in in this meenakshi uh, i think meenakshi amman temple you might have heard it's quite a famous temple and um, that it this was the main uh, center and then uh, the city was situated is situated somewhere in the south central zone of tamil nadu along this river called vaigai and right now it's one of the third most uh, populous uh, regions in the uh, country and uh, this is also called as the cultural uh, capital of uh, uh, tamil nadu now uh, when it in case of uh, madurai right so uh, to give you a little more detail all these temple towns were uh, planned based on the ancient town planning systems there were uh, 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 treatises i mean uh, which called as manasara and shilpa shastra from which uh, the ancient uh, indian architecture was uh, derived from this planning was derived from the uh, specifics of the books written then uh, so how if i can give you a smaller uh, if i can give just a, a conceptual uh, understanding of how these are the temple uh, each temple had i'm not getting into the details of the temple architecture but i'm talking about the temple towns so uh, these temples the periphery of the temples had these temple towers which act, act, acted as the cardinal points and the visual landmarks and then axial it all the temple was planned axially around it and then the inner streets um, which were uh, inner streets were perpendicular linked to the planning now uh, what how how does this relate to culture and just uh, there are a lot of details that has gone into this uh, whole temple planning but i would like to uh, bring out a few important factors which uh, predominantly show how the uh, social, social structure and culture has um, dictated the planning of this now there is uh, first thing is about uh, hierarchy now uh, at, there was a, uh, there is a system of a varna system which is called as varna system which existed where uh, people were classified based on the occupation and um, eventually it, it this converted as caste system and each of these uh, occupation however how, based on how they were related to the temple they they used to live around them so let's say the temple is in the center and uh, the first layer would be uh, people who work for the temple the brahmins or the priestly castes or the royal palaces who uh, did the day to day uh, rituals of the temple they would live around the first two uh, concentric streets maximum and then uh, further in the third uh, or fourth uh, there would be traders businessmen uh, kshatriyas as it's written here they they were the uh, warriors and um, they used to live and then in the uh, further um, in the peripheral uh, streets there would be the laborers and then the servant class so there was a very strong sense of uh, hierarchy in how the uh, spatial segregation was given um, another thing uh, which dictated uh, the scale of these spaces also right so um, an interesting fact is all these streets in madurai uh, were named after 
the Tamil calendar, that is the different months of uh, months in the calendar. Uh, and that was also related to the months with which the particular temple festival would happen. So, um, like I said, the first two streets were occupied by the uh, priestly caste, right? So only those two streets, the temple car procession during a festival, the temple car procession would happen. So, and that would happen in these months of uh, Chittirai and Uttaram. So the streets were named behind that. And then the, even the size of the streets, uh, there was hierarchy in the widths. So the ones which the temple car would go, it was um, the scale was based on the size of the temple car movement and then uh, further it would reduce. So these are uh, these are few ways with which uh, culture has um, uh, mingled with this. Uh, now this this uh, emerged in 550 and now uh, even commercial activities around the temple and all the religious practices uh, still play a dominant uh, force in even with the modern day changes. Uh, although this whole uh, around, if I if you remember the uh, aerial image, the temple town exists and the uh, developments currently they have uh, they are not exactly same as this, but they have. Uh, developed as per the changing needs now but the core of the city still exists um, and and it's, it's still in other practice the next example that i would like to uh, take is called as uh, agraharams so um, agraharams uh, like the name suggests uh, it's called uh, garland of houses so uh, these were basically the uh, dwelling units of the brahmins the priestly cars that i mentioned before these kinds of uh, housing unit actually uh, developed uh, even before the temple towns did in before 300 ad as well and then it uh, evolved uh, through the times uh, so now uh, before i go into the uh, details about Abraharam, let me give an introduction to uh, these people, uh, Brahmins, right? So like I said, their complete lifestyle revolved around the temple. Uh, so uh, from uh, doing the rituals and as well as the community also was a very closely knit uh, community. Uh, they would, uh, everyone had the similar jobs uh, and they would, uh, they were all related. Uh, as well as uh, sharing a very close uh, bonding between them. So this was the uh, way of living of, of lifestyle of this. So now how that reflects in the architecture. Now, um, if, you show, if you can see these images, uh, what happens here is you can see there are uh, rows of houses uh, one next to the each uh, one next to each other walled com common wall and uh, on either side and the, these are uh, linear, linearly planned, and then most of the time it would end in the uh, in in front of a temple. Um, so this was the way it was um, arranged. Uh, so, and the if you can see the planning, these uh, row houses, right? Each unit uh, would start the front would start in a particular lane, and then the rear end it would end in a narrower lane behind as a backyard. This was the basic planning of this community. Uh, and a few things that uh, uh, the observations of these, uh, what I would like to uh, give it to you would be uh, the streets. So now usually in our current scenario, uh, there is a clear demarcation between our uh, streets, roads versus our uh, dwelling units. Uh, here, considering their lifestyle of um, uh, that community living scenario, uh, the streets acted as extended spaces to their houses. Uh, so, and also having houses on both the sides continuously, that itself formed a security and they did not have anything in terms of a compound wall or uh, as such that we have now any security walls, right? Uh, nothing as such. Now, uh, the it's basically it, it just it's merely like a buffer between the uh, opposite household and uh, on a daily uh, it also takes different um, 
it, it, different activities happen through the uh, year and day on a day to day basis, uh, probably chatting and uh, uh, like their common space. It would it any something like a common space it would act and when it uh, turns on a festival day, it, it, they would um, become a, a, like gap. Yeah, houses around will become like galleries from which you wa watch the festival that happens in a common space in between. So it takes different forms. The streets uh, work that way here. And uh, this is also uh, because of the scale, right? The narrower the width, uh, the widths are not too large, narrow, very intimate to, uh, between the households. And that, that has aided the interaction between them. Uh, this is another image of uh, an Agraharam uh, unit, which in, in a current, little more in a current day scenario. Another uh, important element um, which uh, uh, has a lot of cultural value here is uh, called as uh, thin knives. Now, um, these uh, thin knives are, uh, you can see these images. These are, these are basically raised plinths from the street after which you enter the dwelling unit. Uh, now, uh, the absence of uh, security walls in these areas, right? This whole um, uh, planning of this was such that just the formation or the different levels in the uh, plinths and the floor levels basically dictated the spatial, uh, basically def defined the spaces within. Uh, they only had few um, if you can see the planning here, they had few uh, closed rooms for privacy purposes. Uh, beyond that, most of the spaces uh, were defined by the level differences. And uh, which also expresses the dynamics between the families um, that existed. Now, when it comes to thin knife, uh, this acts like uh, just a transition between the public uh, and the semi-public area, and it also took on various functional purposes at that time. Uh, so this was like a space where men would gather uh, for um, um, for exchange of news or conversations in the mornings, and uh, this acted like a threshold between the private space and the public space. And this was also a place uh, to receive strangers, and uh, this was also. Uh, Ref, uh, in different parts, other than Agraharam, in different parts of this um, town, it would be like a place where at that time travelers, when they would walk and go, they would come, rest, they could use this place for resting and uh, continuing the travel. So they uh, they extended their spaces for strangers as well in this uh, form. And um, yes. Uh, like regarding the uh, just uh, just about the spatial planning, uh, like I said, the houses. This is a image of the uh, a plan of the a complete Agraharam uh, street, right? Two three streets together. They were or they also had a grid uh, pattern uh, formed, and then each house uh, would end in the backyard. So uh, let's say this is the main, and then some. The, it would end in the backyard. And uh, so from the front, it would, uh, if I can show you a section of this, uh, so it would start, uh, this would be the street and then the race prince level creates a space and then they call the Tinnai and then we enter a um, anti-space uh, called a Zul Tinnai and then they enter into a courtyard. And this continues and at the end, they go to the backyard uh, and again, that gets connected to the backyard of another house behind. and they they would have a connectivity to that uh, as well. So uh, these uh, were the very uh, another image uh, of the uh, Agraharam. So these are few uh, interesting ways with which uh, the community bonding was also uh, developed with, within these uh, communities. Uh, because of architecture and the architecture was developed because of it. I think they they existed that way. And um, the next uh, the next uh, example that uh, is called as Chetiar uh, Veed. Uh, now it's uh, otherwise we call it as uh, Chetinad houses. Chetinad is a place, and uh, Periya Veed here it means big house. 
So now we, from a settlement, uh, when we saw a settlement pattern, we discussed about how communities lived. Um, and then these are a few examples to show how um, some cases of independent uh, living, right? Um, a single de dwelling unit. Uh, so these were extremely huge uh, mansions that uh, were developed at that point of time. So this was during, uh, uh, so the Chetinar, this region of Chetinar existed uh, uh, from uh, the Chola Pandya period, uh, but then the epitome or uh, the, these mansions were developed after around the 19th, uh, uh, in the 1900s, right? So basically uh, these are people who were uh, banking and uh, businessmen. Uh, this this area is also somewhere uh, near uh, it's it's around uh, 100 kilometers from madurai within that south uh, region and uh, uh, so they were called as not to Kut chetiyars and uh, so just uh, so at around like this place was around 1500 uh, there are around a lot of uh, towns in this chetinar area and then a place called uh, kanada uh, uh, or uh, is also there and karik karikudi it's also called as karikudi that's the capital of chetinar now uh, like i said they were banking and businessmen and then they traded in salt and semi precious stones and they basically started as um, agents of uh, British banks in Burma and then eventually became even money lenders. Uh, so they had trade contacts. Uh, uh, they were uh, across the world, uh, including Vietnam, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, Indonesia, and uh, to even up to Mauritius and uh, South Africa. Uh, so these are sort of an evolved form of traditional Tamil settlements um, that we will be uh, seeing. Now, uh, I'm just uh, showing an image of uh, one of the mansions that uh, exist. So now uh, there were multiple, uh, more than uh, 11,000 mansions that are uh, around that area. And they also had a, a gridiron pattern that they uh, followed. Now, uh, unlike the Agraharams, uh, where uh, these were the activities and the uh, interactions spilled around the houses, these houses were uh, self-contained uh, by nature. So uh, that again comes uh, because of the occupation and the cultural needs of the particular people. Like Brahmins, they were a community. And now these people, these tradesmen, businessmen, their occupation was different. Their uh, interactions were different. So because of which it is, this has developed to such uh, form. Now uh, being, for example, being um, traders and uh, uh, businessmen, right? That meant they had to uh, store a lot of uh, uh, valuables and they needed security um, and uh, their lifestyle was such that the men were mostly uh, away uh, and women needed security when they were living in the in, uh, in the uh, in the town and uh, in the villages so uh, and also the money that involved they they were uh, rich and the li the lifestyle had a so because of which the extravagance in the uh, built form as well now um let me so just take you through a glimpse of the planning spatial planning here if you can see the uh, plan here the section uh, these were extremely huge houses right so uh, they also of course extended from one street to the another and uh, at the entrance, uh, interestingly, they have the similar components like we saw the thin line, the courtyard. Uh, they were they all existed here, but uh, they the usage of it, the reincarnation of it was different here. Now, uh, first, they these spaces were completely uh, walled. Then you enter, and then you have the similar thin lines, and then you have uh, multiple. Uh, uh, zones as they enter so each zone if you can see here the the first second third so each of it has its own uh, courtyard as well and um, let me 
so starting with the thin eye, this, these are a few images of the uh, thin eye, right? So initially these uh, uh, thin eyes were on the either side uh, of the houses, uh, predominantly used by the male members for meetings and uh, con informal conversations. But then because of um, owing to the cultural change, uh, the front thin eye was, uh, was in, was starting to get enclosed in these spaces. Uh, so this is another image of as soon as you enter the thin night, before you go into the uh, spaces, the courtyards, how this uh, a transition space. And now, uh, another important factor, we discussed about hierarchy in the temple uh, town planning. Uh, now there is a different uh, existence of the same thing here, and uh, that also reflects in the architecture. So Mutram is a uh, word, uh, is the Tamil name for uh, courtyards. Uh, uh, most of the time, main courtyards were called Mutram in Tamil. Now, um, like I was showing you uh, the section, we have, uh, it is written here, this, there was clear segregation where the, it's the starting uh, thin eyes were for the guests and then the first level uh, were usually for the men. Uh, so first or two were for the formal meetings, depending on the size of the uh, house, uh, there would be uh, more number of courtyards. So uh, it, they were called as nalakete, etikate. So the basically four and eight, uh, the numbers would differ depending on the size. Uh, and then the first uh, few early, the starting few courtyards and the spaces around were predominantly for the men and the usage of business. And uh, solely when, uh, as they enter to the rear, uh, they were used by women, uh, just giving them the uh, privacy needed uh, and also for them to perform their uh, daily activities as well as uh, the kids were taking care of uh, there. So it was segregated into that. And then slowly as they go into the uh, rear end, uh, they had service courtyards. Uh, so where the cooking and uh, servants and uh, all service related uh, activities would happen. So the their lifestyle was as such and, and hence the architecture developed this way here. Uh, few images to uh, show. These are all uh, the front uh, zones and then uh, these are few zones showing the uh, women where women used to be, right? And the first one uh, is the women's uh, zone, and then the last one showing uh, the image here shows the uh, the ser service courtyard. Uh, and then another interesting thing is uh, these courtyards also took different um, uh, usages in different parts, uh, different times, all their gatherings, all their uh, uh, weddings, everything happened within uh, the, every, they would bring them home and everything happened within the houses. So because of which the, uh, uh, th there was, there is a uh, double height, usually there's a double height space in the front uh, closed hall that gets converted into a wedding uh, hall during uh, a wedding. So now uh, as we discussed the the contrasts that existed, right? Uh, while the components of the mansions and the agraharams are similar, they play contrasting roles based on their uh, social cultural differences. Uh, like one sprawls into the street and dilutes into the street and the other visibly gets cut off, uh, but accommodates all the necessities uh, within it. So uh, now, uh, yes, sorry. So uh, now, nevertheless, uh, architecture uh, as an expression is uh, linked with people, lifestyle, and always makes it an extension of themselves uh, since the earlier times. But uh, now, uh, due to modern uh, scenarios, globalization and industrialization, uh, because of uh, the need to cater to newer requirements, we do sometimes look away from uh, catering to our personal cultural uh, needs as well. So uh, there are also in, in the current scenario in um, while that has happened in Tamil Nadu, uh, there are also some parts where there is revival happening of the components. Um, a few um, images, like this is uh, 
the modern thin eyes of the modern context, right? They they are they are used as verandas where people would sit and get a, a connection to the outdoors, uh, but along with security walls and. Uh, these are few images of how courtyards have evolved in the current uh, uh, scenario in Tamil Nadu, uh, where in modern homes we use it as gathering spaces, but minus the hierarchy, because uh, that doesn't really exist much in uh, the current cultural uh, needs. And uh, these are uh, images of uh, Madurai, right? The temple towns. Uh, like I said, the commercial activity still exists. Um, without much revival, they still exist the way they do. Uh, as a takeaway from uh, all of this, what I would like to uh, just uh, give you a thing is to ponder, just ponder on the dialogue between the two components in different forms and how um, they were successful for those times. And they still carry their identity till now. And probably because of the way architecture was that time, they, uh, the culture in few parts is still, the core culture still exists and they still remind us of the past and we take over, we learn from the past. And um, even the uh, a very sense of scale was always uh, very critical uh, in, in, in the architecture that I was showing, uh, like how um, for in Chetana houses, the scales were completely, uh, uh, large and extravagant as well as the agraharams were uh, uh, close and tightly knit. Um, so these are a few things uh, that we take away from this and we I would like you to ponder and how we could incorporate in our um, upcoming uh, things so that uh, we, uh, for the changing uh, needs and lifestyles, uh, we can elevate our spaces and uh, maybe transfer it to the future as well. Uh, yes, thank you. All right, thank you very much, Prof Nivedita. I think that's an interesting elaboration on how religious influences and social hierarchy can affect not just architecture, species and urban design, but also can, it can affect perception, behavior and human movements of the area. All right, so our, for our next speaker, Hill from UTM itself, Associate Professor Dr. Ellie Sabrina Ismail shall be talking about contestation of power in architecture for the search of Malaysian national identity. The discourse is about the search and formation of national identity architecture in Malaysia with the inclusion of the guidelines and policy from national architecture identity policy, DASIC, and the dichotomy of the patron personal ideology that can be seen in the buildings. So without further ado, I welcome uh, Associate Professor Dr. Ali Sabrina to start the talk. And Dr. Alice, the room is yours. Hey, um, thank you so much, Dr. Izik. Uh, can you see my screen? Is it clear? Yes. Okay. So, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good afternoon to my teammates and colleagues from India uh, and also uh, to uh, Indonesia. And uh, to all the audience and attending this second international webinar series organized by the UTM Architecture Program. And also, I'd like to say thank you so much uh, to Prof. Nevedita and also to Prof. Afriliano. Uh, thank you so much for accepting a UTM invitation as guest speakers for today's uh, international series of webinar. Two organized by UTM. So I'll quickly move on uh, to the next slide. Okay, today's topic for my presentation uh, is actually very dear to my heart uh, because it discusses the issue on the search of a national identity in architecture within the midst of contestation of authority and power among building patrons, country leaders, and also architects. And as you all know, architecture with national identity characteristic is very important because it contributes to the needs of the local community. And my talk today is very crucial because it will seeks to uh, explain why a foundation or institution of social organizational structure seeks development in a multiracial country requires national identity and in this case the need for a national identity must also be reflected through the built environment to showcase the power of a civilization and a country. But if it's wrongly transformed or it being misinterpreted, it will result to many conflicts in the built environment and also to the societal life. 
So the presentation uh, for my uh, today's uh, talk actually will be divided uh, into five main sections. Uh, firstly, I will talk about the def definition of power in architecture and then move on. We will discuss on the role and the need of having a national identity and then uh, followed by suit by the formation of national identity and look into power influence. And then we look at a few examples of case studies in the global and the local context, which is in Malaysia, that shows the impact of power and the misinterpretation of national identity and also related issues into it. And then from there, we'll make a justification and synthesization. What are the recommendations and lessons as we design as architects, students and scholars should learn actually to um, contribute and also to develop our built environment for the betterment of the society. So let me start off first uh, by giving all of you a quote uh, by a prominent modernist architect known as Oscar Niemeyer. And Oscar Niemeyer is a famous Brazilian architect who is considered to be one of the key figures in the development of the modern architecture. And Niemeyer was best known for his design of civic buildings for Brasilia, which is a planned city that became Brazil's capital in the 1960s. And to Oscar Niemeyer, he mentioned that architecture will always express the technical and social progress of the country in which it was carried out. So it is with architecture that one can disseminate political ideology. So if we look deeper into the quotes by Niemeyer, it can be understood that throughout centuries, the relationship between architecture and politics has constantly been intertwined and well demonstrated. And commonly powerful leaders ruling regime in history have embarked actually on a campaign of building to mark their presence and authority in society. So like like Winston Churchill always say, we shape our buildings and thereafter they shaped us. So if we understand this dictum architecture, it is actually interrelated with the human life and social activities because it goes through various processes that involve uh, the specific individual desire. So this is very important because um, architecture is actually a powerful form of communication and it reveals the expression of human ambition and reflect the motivation of those who commission all the public buildings around us. So if you read book uh, written by Sudik, Sone and Goodsell, they mention that the phenomenon actually often occurred in many modern states throughout the world because of the uprising of this political regime. And uh, they showed their power and political ideology actually in symbols in the form of architecture, ritual, ceremonies, and displays to project the idea of legitimization. So how does actually architecture become a symbolic political marker in legitimizing the ruling government authority in society? Or in simple layman term, how does power relate to architecture? So to understand this, uh, I will explain this one in more detail. And to get a clear picture, there are actually four important keywords that we need to understand and see how does politics actually relates to architecture, looking into the terminology and the definition of political ideology, power, authority, and also legitimacy. Okay, so what is actually political ideology? So if you understand the term political ideology, it is actually an ethical stance. It is a set of ideals. It is principles. It is a doctrine, myth or symbols or social movement. So it involves a, a political kind, uh, what you call that, a relationship to the state or the government or for an organized group. And political ideologies have two main aims. First, the arrangement of, for the social structure. And second is actually the implementation of the rules to conduct, to achieve an ideal order in society. So according to Giddens, uh, it states that when you talk about political ideology, there is a lot of differentiation of a political order that exists in society. You can have liberalism, socialism, regionalism, and so many more. But as Giddens states, political ideology is actually closely connected with the concept of power because ideological system actually serve to legitimize the differentiation of power which a group or individuals hold. So um, ladies and gentlemen uh, and my dear audience, what is actually power is all about? Okay, 
So if we look into this slide, uh, in general terms, power actually can be defined as a more or less unilateral potential or known as an ability real or perceived to bring about significant change and usually in people's life. So through action of oneself or of others. And sociologists and politicians, however, usually define power like the ability to impose one's will on others, even if they resist in some way. So according to looks, there are actually six ways of how actually powers operates in society. You can have persuasion. Persuasion is the most subtle way of exercising power. You can have seduction, which is the process of deliberately enticing a person into an act. You have manipulation, which is a control or operate upon a person or a group by unfair means to one's own advantage. And propaganda and then followed by coercion, which is a kind of a compelling kind of a power or practice which employ threat or harm. And then you have a direct force, which is an overt exercise of power. And finally, you have authority. So authority is actually a kind of a stable form of power, which is actually integrates um, at all levels uh, in the social order. And it fully depends on recognition, legitimization, compliance uh, to exercise the role of it in society. So what is actually authority? Because most of our, my discussion today, I will just focusing on power in terms of relationship with authority, because authority is actually the most kind of a pervasive and highly secure type of power institution, which is can be accepted by all, especially in the 20th and 21st century. And most of modern states today in the, in the world actually practicing the rational legal type of authority. And uh, because this is a kind of a form of leadership where the ruling regime, all of the political parties or political leaders obtains its power via a legal and a kind of a bureaucratic kind of a system. So how does actually power manifest itself in architecture? So I think this is a big question that a lot of us might wonder and might ask ourselves. So if you look into um, the manifestation of power in architecture and the concept of power that can be seen in the design of a building, um, it can be seen in three different aspects. Number one, because architecture is commonly used in the tool of service of politics by the ruling government. And since the days of the Egyptian or the pharaoh, actually they're using the, uh, the pyramid itself, a kind of a political statement or political tools to show the, the power leading, uh, what you call that, the ruling regime of the pharaoh up until now, which is the 21st century. And also because of the dynamic qualities of the architecture itself, because it is consists of the form and the spatial layout, which actually can transmit messages in kind of a verbal coding system, which makes communication with the users possible. And as you can see, architecture itself, if you read book by Jenks or by Michael Graves, especially in the postmodernism era, they were always mentioning about architecture as a form of sign and symbol because architecture can easily become a, a kind of a tool that can communicate and can transmit me uh, messages, especially to the mass populace. So in this sense, if we look into this aspect, Architecture is actually commonly used a kind of a, a message or transmit message of political ideology to the audience. Because in this sense, as you can see, a uh, lot of ruling government throughout the world, like Malaysia, perhaps in India or Indonesia, uh, you are using architecture actually, especially the, from the aspect of the ruling government to serve it as a symbol of the state. Because the dynamic qualities of architecture, like I mentioned before, in terms of the and special spatial layout actually translate the building function into a kind of non-verbal coding system. So if you look into architectural form, for instance, the building scale uh, in terms of its height, its length, its width, and its depth actually can signif signify the idea of dominancy and control. And this prevails actually when the build form are presented in very large, tall, or huge manner that are vertical in height, horizontally massive, uh, compared to the human proportion with the surrounding area area and also when a building has a very significant visibility and a kind of a dramatic sculptural kind of an effects. So such example in my slide, as you can see, this is a picture of Burj Khalifa.
Khalifa, which is uh, in Dubai, United Arab Emirates, or UAE, which is currently the tallest building in the world. And it was built actually to showcase the economic standing and the political strength of the um, UAE country as the modern developed develop Islamic state, and also to evoke the feeling of impressiveness and for people to remember it, uh, and also to assert the identity of the leader which is uh, the ruling Islam uh, monarch in the world. So this is actually lending a kind of a visual prestige and symbolize the dignity of the patron and to reinforce the patron's immediate authority and to project their influence in society. So not only that, um, the location of the building form is also another aspect that is defined by its placement on the existing site can also showcasing the idea of political power or ideology. So if you can see on your right hand side in my screen is the building uh, which is located in India, which is the um, Rashtrapati Bhavan or known as the President's House. Uh, formerly known as the Viceroy House, and it was built during the British rule in India. So the British tried to project the idea of dominancy of the imperialists and to suit to their political needs. So this Viceroy House, as you can see, it was located strategically placed on the Raizina Hill and at the end of the terminus point of a very long axial path. So this gives a kind of a design that gives a sense of grandeur from far and a symbolic of the colonial or the British subjugation over India at that time. So in this sense, the embodiment of the ruling body's authority not only be expressed in the form making, but also in the spatial arrangement and also in the organization of the building spatial layout. So if you read the book by Dovey, and he mentioned that there are actually four types of spatial organization that are commonly found in the built form, which is capable to showcase the idea of political ideology and power. So this includes spatial hierarchy, you have spatial structuring, spatial density, and also spatial division. So for instance, in the picture, if you look at the Versailles Palace, so Versailles Palace is located in France and it was built by King Louis XIV during the Baroque period, during the 16th century. So Versailles Palace uh, have a very kind of a unique spatial structuring uh, layout organization to show the authority of King Louis XIV becoming an absolute king. Uh, means like the monarch at that time. And as you can see how the placement and uh, the arrangement of the spaces in terms of the spin, uh, in terms of the syntax arrangement, uh, the king is located at the end of, of, of the planning layout of the um, Versailles Palace. So this also you can see a lot of uh, in a lot of design in especially in Europe building like the Romania Parliament and also the Hungary Parliament. So the next question is, how does power and national identity in architecture is interrelated? So as you all know that from my description previously, I mentioned that a lot of uh, this idea of politics and culture is actually weaved into the nation state space and structure, thus actually shape the national identity. So and if we look relate back to national identity, identity at the national level is only and often shown and associated with various kind of elements of nationhood like emblems, signs, buildings, and even customary practice of a country. So in this sense, what is national identity? And I think this is a big question, especially for the new developed state like Malaysia and India for itself, because most of the designers are actually arguing and we are actually searching the national identity that re can represent the architecture of our own nation or our own country. So if you understand the term of national identity, identity means uh, affiliation to a nation because of one acceptance is based upon tradition, culture and language. And when we talk about national identity, it's always relates to the sense of belonging, attachment, being to a nation or having a national nationality and also so another one, when you understand about national identity, it is about the collective culture that rules the socialization, where in this sense, uh, it gives the sense of belief, values, assumption, perception, and relates to a certain member of a group or a community. So in this sense, we need a national identity, actually, especially for our newly developed state. So 
why, why is this question the big question and everybody will start to argue why do you need national identity because in this sense as you can see number one is about ensuring unification and integration especially when you live in a multiracial society like malaysia you have the chinese the indians and there's a lot of different kind of races you need to bound you need to bond and also you need to bound them together so that there'll be no kind of conflicting views arising among a lot of different uh, races or different interracial society with different background. And once when you have this national identity, it's also very important to cultivate unity and integration or the better known word as social cohesion among the people and also to showcase the country's success for gaining national and international recognition. And this is very important, especially for political leaders, actually, to rally for massive support and to get well acceptance uh, from the masses uh, also from the community so there are actually two main factors that shape national identity in architecture one is the fixed factors and another one is the dynamic factors so the fixed factors is what we known as the non-changeable factors that is actually existing on site for example geological setting landscape climate culture and so forth and i think previously prof nida uh, nividita explained about how culture actually influence uh, the kind of a settlement or a living settlement in Tamil Nadu so for centuries because it shows that the national identity of the Indian culture still maintain up until now even though you are living in the 21st century so these are known as also the identity of the fixed factors but if you look at the dynamic factors they are also interchangeable factors uh, for instance country's economy political social milieu and condition this is what we known as interchangeable factors that actually can influence the shape of the national identity of a nation and also in including the designer's perception uh, the architecture trend of movement and also the technology and also the material advancement so in short or in brief what i'm trying to explain all about is that national identity actually influenced the proportion of the building the appearance, the style and the principles of the building design and also namely in the design function. And if you can see, there are two examples here that I gave in my slide. One is the National Conference building in Kuwait. And this one shows how the designer using the dynamic factors uh, influence into the design of the National Conference in Kuwait. And another one is uh, Charles Korea when he designed the Kachajunga apartment in India and where Charles Korea design was actually a lot of influence comes from the fixed factors which is the climatic local climatic conditions that allow a lot of natural ventilation into the high-rise uh, housing building of the Kachanjuga apartment with a lot of air holes and air wells and so forth so but the big question here that I think we need to discuss thoroughly uh, once when the question and session are uh, answer open is that about the misconception of and the misinterpretation of national identity because when you have a, a lot of different designers with different background, you have a politician with own personal interests, and you have the society of the community with their own belief system. This is where there's a lot of misinterpretation comes into the uh, projection of a national identity into a nation or into a country, especially through the built environment. And first, you can see is in terms of the search of the national identity itself. And second is on the purpose of the appearance of the national architecture identity. So to understand this, and I think it will be very beneficial also because we have audience from Indonesia and also from India today, not only from Malaysia, I will just use the case study of the Malaysian uh, architecture development. Because if you look at the history of Malaysian architecture as a case study, it is very unique because it is divided into the two main phases, which is the earliest and which is the later years. So the earliest in the 14th uh, up to the 18th century, it is where comprising a lot of the traditional um, era where there's a lot of pre-colonial subjugation by the Portuguese and the Dutch and then followed by the colonials and then after we achieve our post-independence that is the era of we have this uh, leadership of Tunku Abdul Rahman up until now which is uh, Dato Ismail Sabri which is our ninth uh, Malaysian Prime Minister 
So as you can see before the 14th century, the architecture identity of architecture in the Malay Peninsula, which is Malaysia, is confined into a more domesticated scale built form. And there's a lot of traditional houses, you have madrasa, you have palaces, and also you have uh, a lot of uh, architecture style that is responsive towards the climate and usage of local materials, and that is influenced by the local custom and belief. And we also are actually during that time influenced by a lot of of uh, culture and also architecture from neighboring places, from Indonesia, from Riau, from Sumatra, from Java, which is actually reflected in the roof design, especially during the uh, traditional era of Malaysian architecture. So the most prominent example building uh, during this traditional era is the Kampung Laut Mosque, uh, which is the oldest mosque in Malaysia, and it was built in the 14th century, which resembled the Masjid Agung Dema in Indonesia, that shows uh, the sensitiveness to the local climate in terms of its three-tiered roof design. And then um, during, after the uh, traditional era ends, we have the subjugation of the Dutch and the Portuguese. And I think Indonesia also have the same culture as us because Indonesia also be subjugated by the Dutch. India also be subjugated by the colonial. So same goes to Malaysia. So in the 15th up to the 17th century, there's a lot of changes had occurred in the um, local landscape, the built environment of the architecture in the Malay Peninsula. So at this time, when the Dutch and the Portuguese comes in, they brought in uh, this idea of not only looking into building as domesticated scale, but they are blowing up the building into a, a more kind of a fortress-like, a more monumental scale. And there's a lot of building, as you can see in Malacca, uh, which is the Red House, the Stead Highs, you have uh, churches. And uh, this gives a new kind of a different style during the subjugation period of the Dutch and the colonials, where there's a lot of uh, Neo-Gothic, Renaissance, Palladian, Tudor influence, the British comes into uh, the Malaysian context. And then when you have the late 18th century, where the colonials comes in, um, the British comes into Malaysia and gives a lot of impact, especially in our Malaysian architecture. And it has been for 130 years up until we achieved independence in 1957. So the British had changed our landscape, our political milieu, our economic standing, our social structure, and also our built environmental landscape. So the British not only become the dominant builders, they are not the influencer, the designers, but they are also determining how the architecture scenario or the um, identity of our buildings look like, especially for our public topologies building like the schools, amenity centers, mosques, shop houses, palaces, and so many more. So the British comes in and they brought in their own ideology. But the, the best part about the British when it comes into Malaysia is that they try to blend in or assimilate uh, the European architectural elements into the local context. And this you can see uh, surface a lot of styles known as the straight electric style. Uh, and this you can see in a lot of uh, shop houses, uh, especially in Malacca, in Penang, in KL. And you have also uh, another popular style brought in the by the British from India and marinate within the local context of Malaysia known as the Anglo-Indian style and also the Mughal architecture. And this you can see a lot in if you go just to KL, uh, there's a lot of Kuala Lumpur, there's a lot of building like Masjid Jame, um, you have the uh, Malaysian courthouse and so forth. So the British tends to have this tendency of uh, marinating the, the local Malay Islamic architecture with the European kind of a taste, but still bounded within the tropical climate itself. And there's a lot of style surface, like you have neoclassicism, Mughal, straight eclectic, uh, European classical, art deco, and so forth. But once when we achieve our independence in the 1957, uh, the first era was uh, under Tunku, um, this is what I know and love to, 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 to discuss with all of you because this is the known of the experimental era in Malaysia because there is a, a two kind of views. One is that under the leadership of Tunku, where Tunku tried to showcase Malaysia and tried to showcase uh, Malaysia new direction as a newly independent state. So at this time also, there is a, a contrast within the architects itself because once when the architects serve in the public work departments, 
architects. Uh, many of them are still British architects, uh, but they are still influenced by the local culture. So, and they are still uh, bounded by the vision of Tunku trying to showcase Malaysia as a newly independent state. So Tunku's ambition was try to get the rally and the support of the Malaysian people towards the country to be united, to propagate the idea of nationalistic sentiment. So in this sense, the PWD worked together with the ideology and the vision of Tunku. And there's a lot of uh, most famous prominent building uh, showed up during this time. Like you have the National Mosque designed by Datuk Baharudin, uh, the Parliament House designed by Ivor Shipley that showcased this idea of modernistic expressionism style that showcased the abstraction of Malay architecture into the modern architecture language. And at the same time, also in the 1960s, there is influence from the modern master builders. You have um, like Lee Corbusier on the brutalist architecture, you have the Frank Lock Wright on the organic architecture, the Mies van der Rohe on the structuralist architecture. So all of these trends and ideology are brought in by these uh, British architects and also by the local uh, architects who are actually educated in the overseas and, and they brought in this idea and marinate and come up with, with a lot of different experimentation of architecture style. And uh, you can see also the example of the National Museum by Ho Kok Kyo that shows this uh, modern revivalism kind of a vernacular approach and you have this hospital Kuala Lumpur the general hospital Kuala Lumpur designed by Wells and Joyce uh, using this egg crate design like the Chandiga uh, designed by Le Corbusier in India and its exterior facade so the era of Tun, uh, Tunku Abdul Rahman doesn't only stay there so the ideology and the vision of Tunku Abdul Rahman was also brought forward by Tun Raza and Hussein On, which is our second and also our third prime minister. But under Tunku and but under Tun Raza and Tun Hussein On, it is more towards economic consolidation. So I'm calling this era as a development era because there's a lot of new economic policy plan come after into place because Malaysia faced a big crisis in the 13 May 1965 racial riot because of known as the um, economic imbalance between the Chinese, the Malays and the Indian. So this era at that time showed a lot of influx of populace from villages into big cities and big cities open up like you have Chiras town, um, you have uh, new satellite towns like uh, Ampang uh, and, and KL starts to grow and starts to boom and become an industry kind of a place. So Tun Raza and Tun Hussein on vision at this time was that try to marinate and try to heighten up the economic uh, value system among the citizen and among the masses right so at this time uh, there's a lot of uh, public building was built and the first one is Ampang Park Plaza which is the first public uh, complex building and at this time it shows the marination between regionalism and also uh, between the local context so then we move on to the era of Mahade Badawi up until now the nine prime minister so it is more shows showcase a lot of different kind of architecture style of uh, what you call that uh, challenges and also different style of architecture, looking into deconstructivism, you have blobby texture and so forth. So in year 2000, there's a big uh, marination and there's a lot of uh, collaboration between the government and also the local architectural bodies and this time DASIC came into place. So DASIC is known as DASA Sinibena Identity Kebangsaan, which is uh, prepared by the Board of Architect Malaysia. So DASIC tried to come up with one kind of a module that showcases what is the best guideline of policy for Malaysia architecture for the future but unfortunately and sadly to say that DASIC is still at the draft policy and it is not uh, officially emphasized and implemented so in this sense there's a lot of coming uh, into unsuccessful attempts of conveying national identity and you can see there's a myriad of Putra Mosque PWTC and also Perdana Putra and uh, I just go very quickly, uh, moderator, I know time is up. So one is the Perdana Putra, as you can see, showcasing the ideology and political vision of Mahade that borrowing the Persian Islamic architecture, trying to showcase Malaysia as a newly independent uh, Islamic state. And you have the National Palace uh, in Malaysia and also the Perdana Putra, the one that I explained earlier. The Petronas Twin Tower by Sezapelli okay, symbolizes the icon and also the economic standing of Malaysia becoming a modern uh, state. And not only that, university also has the same kind of an ideology. This is USIM. 
okay, uh, you can see signs Islam Malaysia that was built during the era of Badawi and Najib. So at this time, uh, Usim symbolizes the icon of the Malaysian 12th University, trying to vision Islam and science and technology into its facade treatment. It's a kind of a funny look that mixed between Greek classicism, neoclassicism, and suddenly you have a blue dome on top of the facade treatment. And okay, as a summary, I know moderator, my time is up. So in Malaysia, we need to question, and not only in Malaysia, in Indonesia, and also in other parts of the world, we need to question ourselves about the function of each building that is constructed. We need to have a deep understanding with regards to the building design goals and aim. So if all of the above can be a lesson, we can actually solve the dissatisfaction between the government and also the people. So if this can be successfully implemented, only the desire and the true meaning and the formation of the architecture with national identity can be achieved. So this means that once we're going to design a building, we need to look into the concept of the climate, the technology, the political ideology, the heritage identity, and the most important one, the value that symbolizes Malaysia as a country's administration, which is parliamentary democracy. Okay, with that, I'd like to end my today's talk. Thank you so much. I pass it back to you, Dr. Isaac. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Ellis. An interesting breakdown on how the concept of power can affect the characteristic of a building, which include the skills of the building, special arrangements, superficial or facade elements, and relational properties to be as symbolic to the colonial ruling bodies in an effort to achieve the display of dominance. The discourse is about how we can look into the procreation of architecture with national identity while contesting with the influences of personal ideology infused with the conception of power or dominance. All right, so now we go into our last speaker of the session today, uh, Professor Afrilino, who is an assistant professor from uh, Universitas Tanjung Pura, Indonesia. And he will be talking about the rethinking architecture and urbanism through public space in West Kalimantan, Indonesia. The gist of the talk is about how architecture can have significant contribution to the city in the face of plethora of urban environmental issues that requires urban design to be comprehensive and incorporate values that can influence the very fabric of the city and its environment. And with this, I give away this room to our last speaker of the session. Please welcome uh, Professor Afril. And the room is yours. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Isik. Uh, I want to thanks first to the Profilis, okay, Profilis, to the Nifidita, okay, okay. I think I think it's time to scroll up. I think I'm gonna speed up. So uh, our topic is about uh, thinking architecture and urbanism through the public space in the West Kalimantan of Indonesia. We share for the Season, okay. Okay. Okay, bro. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, this season I will uh, uh, make it in the two parts. First, from from the part one about the architecture and urbanism, uh, about the territorial position, and about the frameworks, and the second part about the public space in Pontianak City, West Kalimantan, Indonesia. Uh, when we talk about the city, I think the cities and the, we have a, a big problem here. When urban condition are faced with the environmental issue. Global warming, declining ecology, urban density, poverty, desert, and etc. It's mark a question for us and architect and architecture itself. Can architecture make a significant contribution to the city? I think not. It is the answer here. But architect need to construct thinking and provides comprehensive input for the improvement of the city future. Interaction between the built environment and the city dweller, it makes in form it's form a way of living. Uh, our life behavior in the geographical, political, social, economic, and cultural order, and it's give a positive and negative contribution to the environment or in its habit and itself. Uh, architecture is not only studies about and deal about the physical environment here, but 
it's closely related to the human aspect as a subject who experience space and through their motion and sensory function and leads to the interaction. So interaction maybe is the important thing here because it's it's between human and to humans, human in nature and so on. So this is so it's so that the in, in built environment there is a social interaction. Interaction between architecture and urbanism also provides a process of awareness of space and social life in its in short urban as a public space in their social support is not only the application of formula of a building or technical and a formal construction, but it also a part of dialectical process and cultural interaction. Architecture with an urban spirit is a form of architectural development as a result of uh, attitude towards the distance and development. Therefore, the appearance and defense of the architecture with an urban spirit is an articulation and a reflection of the level of the human awareness and understanding in interpreting dynamic change, both socio-culturally, both socio-economic, even and even social politically. Looking at the phenomenon of the urban development, we can make a conclusion that the architecture and urbanism are clearly an inseparable connection here. To the but uh, according to the directions here, to see this, human settlement are divided within a settlement inhibited by men, which uh, the divides the essential settlement into two major elements, container and content. This is the most important thing maybe in here, container and the contents. Because uh, Hestin Wuladari also cited from the dossier uh, architecture and urban as a result of a broad environment and its human life as a content and content, it's secure in a formally planned and designed process. So, therefore, architecture and urban involved in science of planning and design. The city is a physical built environment that plan and design. It also clarifies the interrelationship of the city architecture, city architecture, urban planning, and urban design. So, we come to the territorial frameworks from the Arthur Urban. That's Arthur Urban has made interaction. So it's 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 made a container and content. So it's it's also planning and design. That that conclusion may be the most uh, most thing is the city is a physical built environment that is planned and designed. The the key word is the plan and design here. Next, we are moved to the architecture, urban design, and urban planning. Urban design uh, is often people say it's about urban design, it's about a big architecture. Jadi, so it makes it makes sense because uh, urban design is not only including a uh, building but also another part of the urban itself. Here comes the statement about the urban design from Hamid Sherpari from Buchanan, from Roger Transix, and Lucas Sosi, Sidris, and Banerjee, next to the Cantanis and Schneider, Barnett and Pierre Mellon and Kwang Hoisa, and the last from the Muhammad Daniswaro. That's make a conclusion. That's uh, characteristic in urban design, including an urban design which is focused on the physical form of the city and its environment has a public dimension. This first one, and the second is urban design attention focus on the composition of the artificial environment, not a uh, official building, in the public visual environment and the relationship with the public open space here. So from the I I will not uh, saying a lot of statement because it takes a lot of time. Okay. It comes the theoretical uh, frameworks. It's about the architecture and urban design, urban planning. It's, it's based on the, we, we're talking about this, about uh, from the scale. Architecture is in the micro scale, urban design and meso scale, and urban planning on the macro, macro scale. From the urban planning, it's focused on the aspect of the urban planning, focused on the structuring aspect you know, of the usability and needs. And the result is at the public policy. When it's talk about the urban design, it's focused on the physical design aspect of the city and the environment. 
with more inclined to the aesthetics aspects, visual and brands. And the result of the urbanization is composition, design of physical environment. And back to the architecture with the, on the micro scale, it's focused on the physical design in the micro, related to the aesthetic and the functional aspect. So the result is the physical environment here. Next part about the public architecture. From the, according to the Philip Jody Dion, architecture can be classified according to its use, building type or house or other criteria that it will seem so that building can most readily be divided into two basic categories, private structure such as house and public building such as rail house, station, stadium or museum. Or in other words, the term of the public architecture refer to the building and space that's built for the public using the public tax fund. And the theoretical frameworks from the public sector should be like this. That the public sector is the building and space that's built for the public interest. And the second part is maybe the physical environment that embodies the characteristic of the urban design. And the last one, a general approach that's related to the urban visual environment. From those uh, three part of the part one, you can make a conclusion. No, sorry. From the architecture and urban to the architecture urbanization and urban planning to the public architecture, it can we can describe it in the architecture and urbanism in the term of the architecture itself. Uh, the result is an architecture with an urban spirit. This is the most uh, thing that, that we, we, we need to achieve when we, we talk about the asset urbanism in the, in the public space, in the public building. So we need uh, urban spirit in the sector so we can, make, can achieve the, the goal that we can make a better living for uh, people and society here. Okay, that's, thank you for the, from the part one. We next to the move the part two. The part two is uh, the public space in Bonaire City, West Kalimantan, Indonesia. Uh, let me first introduce about the uh, Kalimantan Barat uh, or, or West Kalimantan, or maybe more people know about the West Borneo. This is the West Kalimantan, which is part of Indonesia, with the Pontianak, is the capital city of the Kalimantan Barat or West Kalimantan. We do have a uh, Sungai Kapuas or Kapuas River and Panda River as the city, as the main city, as the uh, the main river in the our province. The river itself is the largest, the largest river in the Indonesia. Kapuas River is larger, it's, uh, larger river in Indonesia. It's make a huge impact for our living in the Pontianak and Kalimantan Barat itself. Also, the section from the Sungai Kapuas and Sungai Landa in here is become the symbol of our uh, our city here. So yeah, the Sungai Landa and the the Landa River and the Kapuas River become the the symbol of our city here. Okay, next one. Back to the conclusion before that architecture and urban spirits. When we talk about the public sector. It's it's gonna it's gonna up to us which as is fits with us with a public building or the public space here. But uh, the definition of the public building or the public space when we talk about the public sector, we need to uh, deeper research in location and characteristic and the needs. For the Pontianak City West Kalimantan, uh, the public space is more uh, like suitable for the Pontianak City. 
uh, like example here is the Pontianak Water River, Pontianak Waterfront City at the Kapuas River. This is the waterfront at the Pontianak City. This is the design from the 1917, uh, from the 2017. Uh, when the our governor Miji uh, start to renounce that the program will will give the impact on the uh, along the river of the Kapuas River. Began the 2017 and 2019 we can go to the to the to the waterfront so we can have the goods uh, view and a good uh, good view in uh, the of the city here. But after the COVID-19 impact on the public space in here, it's impact the our cities from from now and even more in the future. This pandemic give a big chance in how we interact as people as or the community. Perhaps the most important things that uh, have to respond is the sensitive concern here. The public space can be a frightening specter when the density is associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. On the other hand, the government will also make this point an important point to watch out for. Public space seems to be dead to with the current pandemic condition, and the people are also afraid of, uh, of overcrowding because it associates them with the mass transmission like the COVID-19 pandemics. In the end, the design of the public space must accommodate all the new thing after the COVID-19 pandemic. The design boundaries and the rules needs to be clarified so that the public space are better for everyone who provides a sense of security and comfort for user. This uh, this is the image of the when the 2019 when the before the pandemic. It's uh, it's it showed us uh, waterfront uh, city is is keep a big a big huge impact for the people of the uh, Pontiana city because it's it's give them a place where can we gather when we have another uh, like the old uh, like the old person when the city is becoming and the view of the river is made a good a good point in here but uh, when it's come to the COVID-19 uh, it's the two pillars that emerged in the COVID-19 pandemic include the social distancing and density. This is the two point where the pandemic uh, issue uh, shows that social distancing and distancing become uh, the most uh, thing that we need to to aware of this. The emerge of the two pillars become new instrument that inventability become a crucial part of the design process, especially uh, public sector. The following picture are the expression of how application of the social distancing and the city values takes a part of the design process here. In this part, uh, in this part, uh, we have that seen that uh, before the before the pandemic that uh, in the waterfront city there's a threat pipelines that uh, we can together and the density is not a, a big problem here because it's it's okay but when we need to uh, think about this social distance in the city I think that uh, density and big social distance is most uh, part that we need to to aware so i think i this is the adaptation of the adaptation of the idea how to we react about the density and the social distancing uh, we give the spots here make a lot of spot that's separated from the from the straight path line so people are separated from the from the from the from the each other so it's it's it makes uh, it's avoided the overcrowding and also it avoided the density here. So the new pillars is density and social distancing here and here. This is the approach design uh, from from me to 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 make it still uh, still in use of the waterfront city. So we can we can so we can endure the 
the COVID-19 affects to all sovereign is all. I think that's all. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rizik. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Prof. Afriel. I think that's an interesting take, looking at the framework, elaborating on the interrelationship between architecture, urban design and urban planning, and how it, it influences the public spaces to achieve holistic development with an urban spirit that incorporates different values, both contemporary and traditional values. All right, I think uh, <clears throat> with that being said, uh, we are going straight into the Q&A session. Uh, I thank you to all the speakers involved. Now I would like to open the session to Q&A. Uh, should you have any question, you can open the mic and feel free, to, feel free to ask question, or you can put your question in the chat section uh, and make sure you quote which speaker you want your question to reach for. However, uh, at the moment, I already have like uh, five questions uh, in place uh, for our speaker. So uh, the the first two questions is actually going into uh, going for uh, Prof Nivi, all right. So the question number one is how was the ex how is the acceptance of the locals in the current context on the modern housing since there are a lot of changes compared to the traditional houses. Prof Nivi. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so now yes, there are a lot of changes, but. Uh... The examples that I was showing you, it uh, was quite a few centuries in back. And then there has been a lot of gradual change through the time of uh, industrialization, uh, colonization, and then British invasion. So people have gone through a lot of things and then now reached to a certain point. So it was not a, a immediate change for them to accept it. But um, what is important uh, that we because of all these reasons maybe we have lost in touch with a few important things that could have been existed that uh, can be taken away but then the acceptance has people have adapted to it uh, slowly that is the scenario like how buildings shape us right that has happened i think i hope i answered your question Okay, probably we. Uh, we have another question. Uh, architecture is a product of the culture that it was designed for. From your presentation, we were able to realize how the ancient or tra traditional architectural elements like courtyard or tinai have started its way back into modern architecture. Uh, what do you think the function? Uh, but do you think the functions uh, remains the same as it used to be? As architects, can we try to do something on this? Okay, so uh, the function. Uh, the core uh, essence of it uh, remains where uh, courtyards can work like gathering spaces for interaction and then like uh, the verandas could work like a scenario where still uh, uh, anyone new guests coming would transition or some stranger come transition but then definitely uh, it has to adapt to the cultural changes because uh, we as people evolve and uh, our belief systems differ like, for example, the hierarchies that were expressed earlier uh, doesn't exist or needn't exist uh, further. So it has to uh, evolve. Um, and so we as architects probably have to bridge that, uh, take away the good things and then uh, develop them for the future. Uh, because it is still up to us on what we give can affect um, that. So, yeah. All right, uh, Prof Nivi, I think we have an, uh, we have another question coming uh, for you, actually. So, uh, Chachar community have been in Malaysia since 19th century doing trading. Many of them are rich Tamil merchants and bankers. Uh, I would like to know whether there were any Malaysian influences on Chatinat mansions in Tamil Nadu. Uh, yes, uh, in terms of details, uh, not just Malaysian, a lot of, uh, um, because it was during the time of colonization, a lot of uh, foreign influences were seen in the uh, elements that they brought, uh, the materials that they used, or details, architectural uh, details that they brought in. Uh, there are mansions which were of two floors, where predominantly the ground floor had a lot of Tamil planning, and when it, go to the up, when it went to the upper level, the colonial influences were seen as well as uh, yeah. what they got from uh, trading from Malaysia and everything. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you, Prof Nivi. 
So I move on to uh, another question here. This one is directed to uh, Dr. Ellis. Okay, question number one. How do you summarize the architectural national identity based on patrons ideology in terms of its benefits to the country and its people? Dr. Ellis? Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Izik. Okay, um, patrons ideology actually plays an important role in shaping our national identity. We cannot run from that. But the, the, the big question here is that the way of how we give them awareness and how do we educate our patrons, especially our political leaders who run and manage the country. Because most of our public buildings, especially government buildings, are being funded by this patron or, or by, by this uh, politician. So politicians need to have some certain kind of education and, and we need to educate them about what is the meaning of national identity. If you understand the concept of national identity, it, it has the the sense of it means the sense of belonging and the sense of attachment so in this sense you need to have the spirit of place and spirit of time so but if you can see in a lot of the 21st century in the malaysian uh, architecture like the previous examples that i show like the padana putra and and the putra mosque and so forth most of them doesn't a lot of showing the uh, sense of belonging and attachment of the local architecture context especially in showcasing malaysia as a political a democratic society or democracy nation because we tend to see when we design the Padana Putra, for instance, the administrative building, we imported the neoclassical, the Greek, the Romans elements into it. And then we borrowed the, the, the dome from the Mughal and the Persian architecture. So where is Malaysian architecture? Where is our own national identity to symbolize Malaysia as a democratic uh, society or democratic nation? So I won't elaborate detail what is the concept of democracy because there, there's a huge uh, discourse about it. But uh, if you are interested, you can always email and ask me after after this discussion. Yep, I think that's answer snippets of it, uh, Dr. Izzy. <laughs> okay, Dr. Ellis. Okay, another question for you, Dr. Ellis. Uh, architecture is still intricately tied to power, and uh, though we say its prominence has become less explicit. We still, we still see governments and political leaders want to showcase propaganda, authority and everything else to show off with irrelevant buildings, which many times never make sense. And your closing slides talk about still in search for a national identity in Malaysia architecture. What in your opinion can be a way out from this? So power is appropriately used and is appropriate, appropriately related to architecture? <clears throat> yeah. Okay. If if you understand the seminar works by looks, uh, he mentioned about there is a sixth category of how power uh, associated with society. Uh, the one that I mentioned, you have uh, manipulation, seduction, persuasion, coercion. Uh, but the most common one that people try to use is authority because authority is a kind of a rational legal that is being accepted by all throughout the nation and also the global global and also the local context. So if if we look at architecture. Uh, the biggest question goes back to you as the patron or as the designer itself. What kind of function and what kind of purpose that you are trying to showcase your building? Are you trying to showcase the idea of power in terms of manipul manipulating people, coercion people, persuading people, or is it trying to showcase this idea of authority? So if you're talking about authority, it relates back to the idea of a national identity that relates back to the one that I mentioned, the sense of belonging and attachment, talking about the spirit of place and spirit of time. Yep. So this is the sense that I think goes back the question to the designer. Because most of our designers have a very uh, kind of uh, not big much awareness of knowledge talking about intellectual discourse on the architectural theory and philosophy. We tendency to have this idea of pastiche architecture, copy and paste. Hey, I like Persian, I like Greek, I like Roman. And at the end of the day, all become a roja architecture. Roja means Malaysia, a mixing of so many things in one plate. And you serve it to the, uh, to the, to the audience or you serve it to the user. So... This is back to the question, we as designer, are we fully being educated? Do we have fully good awareness and education about our theory and philosophy and history of architecture? So if we understand who we are and where do we come from, I don't see that there is a big problem and issue that what kind of architecture that we're going to shape for the future of, of our nation and for our built environment. Okay, so I think that's answered my question, uh, the, the question from the audience, Dr. Izik. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Dr. Ellis. All right, so next question is directed to uh, Prof. Afrilino. 
Okay, how do we determine a good public architecture? Is there any specific indicators to determine that a good public design, uh, public space design? Uh, public space design, I think the most important is the characteristic of the people and the society inside it. Because it's the, it's people as the end user who will, who will, who will using that's the public space. Because uh, when we do, for like example, we have a museum and the waterfront city, but most people of Fontana will go to waterfront city rather than the museum. It's it makes sense because the people of the Fontana is rather have to be a gathering, uh, uh, be, uh, rather than the, the museum. So it's better to to build a something that uh, public space based on the characteristics of the people uh, for its first and. and I think it needs a big uh, research in here. That's all. Okay. Uh, thank you, Prof. Afril. Uh, we have uh, another question actually directed to Prof. Nivi. Uh, a fundamental question. Uh, may I know why the Gopuram of Tamil Nadu temples are very tall and colorful, uh, expressing power, but the interior are selectively painted. How they determine the height of Gopurams of each temple? Any temple hierarchy? Uh, so the Gopurams, uh, of course, evolved through periods, uh, different periods of time. When initially, when it started off, it, they were not as tall as they were, and slowly, uh, when they learned the, uh, when they understood the, um, evolved the temple architecture itself, the proportions and scaling um, got better. Of course, uh, temples uh, are treated with respect, and then it has to uh, show power. And it had to show more than power, uh, respect towards God, and then looking up to it, uh, higher than some uh, our general uh, architecture. So it had that uh, connotation to it, and be because of which they were they were tall. Externally colorful, internally ideally they are. We don't use them only the lower space as an entryway. Uh, the internal portion of the gopuram is just a service area, and externally, uh, for sure they want uh, the. Uh, kings at that time wanted to show the uh, richness of their period. So that was also involved uh, when anything uh, large were built uh, to act as landmarks and then uh, important uh, built and uh, built, um, uh, how do I say, built landmarks of that period of time. So other than that, hierarchy in terms of different uh, temples doesn't exactly exist. It was uh, more a development and reasons behind uh, the kings and queens, that, I mean, kings' um, decisions and uh, richness that involved at that period of time when it was built, the money that involved. And of course, the proportions uh, that they needed to achieve for the elegance that they wanted. I hope I answered your question. Okay, thank you, um, Prof. Nivi. Yeah. Uh, we are still open for question. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I I have already shared the uh, attendance link for the audience today. So please take a look at the chat box section. Uh, section. Uh, basically, we have uh, two attendants uh, for OGC uh, under Online Global Classroom for local students and international students. And uh, for general attendance with uh, e-certificates. So I, I've already provided a link. Uh, uh, to to the uh, to the attendance as well. Okay, so uh, we're still open for the um, uh, question and answer. Uh, any question uh, for our speakers today? We still have like ten minutes to spend for Q and A session. Hello. Mashita. We are still open for Q and A session. We still have ten more minutes for Q and A session. Uh, Professor uh, Sam. Yes. Hi, Professor. Yeah. Uh, hi. I mean, um, uh, out of curiosity, I mean, uh, we talked about Burj uh, Khalifa, and uh, most of us know, I mean, though it is called to be the tallest tower in the world, it doesn't have a solid waste management system, and every day, you know, we can see tons and tons of, um, you know, crap flying on the roads of Dubai and, you know, taken somewhere else, you know, to be uh, kind of uh, sludged or whatever it is. 
and what you talked about the patronus and you know everywhere you know where we need to actually educate the architects and the people in power you know the need of the r um now i was also having a critical question about the patronus towers and i mean very very clear in, in terms of what they wanted to achieve now when we build skyscrapers you know which where every skyscraper has got its own set of standards codes and i mean none of these skyscrapers are, i mean uh, similar they're unique uh, in your perception uh, do you think um, all these elements are to be taken into consideration you know before they start of the building or rather you know proclaiming themselves to be the tallest tower in the world or anything of that sort Okay, uh, thank you, Prosem. This goes back to the question of, of power and also architecture. Because uh, if, if you are a king, you are a monarch, or you are a political uh, figures and things like that, you always want to, to, to set a mark for yourself or a landmark or a status or stature uh, to show you the sense of belonging or attachment to you, to the nation and things like that. And I think since the olden days, like I mentioned, uh, before it's about like if you look at the egyptian for instance egyptian architecture that's the earliest of pharaoh they build this huge pyramid of giza that is still standing up until now so this actually is trying to show the status of, of the ruling government so but but the big question is that so who is whoever in power maybe who rules malaysia india or indonesia or any parts of the states of the world uh, we need to ask the big question of ourselves is is that the building that we are designed, what is the purpose? If you're trying to signify the, the country's stature and status to symbolize it as a well-developed state or developed state to the global rec to get global recognition from the others and things like that, or is it that we are building the build form is actually for the needs of the society? So, for instance, if I'm taking example in the Malaysian case, right, the 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 Putra Mosque, okay, the cost maybe is about I'm not so sure the the, the real cost, but it may be let's say about forty million for one mosque, for instance. But instead of you spend about forty million for building just one mosque, isn't it best that you can spend the forty million to have let's say forty mosques all around the city for the community to use, isn't it? Rather than you build something that is huge and costly, and I think um. In Indonesia, under the uh, leadership of Suharto, Sukarno also has this some um, kind of uh, Malaysia also the same, where you have this megalopolis projects, uh, megas projects, and things like that, trying to to, to show the stature of the ruling government or the ruling party. So uh, this is the big question that I think. Um, of course, political leader will have that stance. They will have the creed, the credence to do that. But but the, we as professional architects, I think we need to have a lot of more discourse, trying to educate the public, the, the politician, the leaders that where are we heading actually, Prof. Sam, isn't it? So because if, if you if you understand the concept of architecture, architecture is like you create a built environment for everyone. That's what we mean, a democratizing architecture. So it's for everyone to use for the purpose of everyone. So if you go back to the concept of power, for instance, I'm I always like to take the example of madrasa. Madrasa is the Islamic religious school, and I think in India you also have it, in Indonesia and in Malaysia you also have it. So madrasa is designed, but not under the concept of authority. It is more under the concept of persuasion. And how most of many of madrasa design, I'm taking one example of madrasa Kubang Bujo in, in, in Malaysia, for instance, in Trugano. Uh, the way how the madrasa was designed, the concept of openness. There's no walls, there's no boundaries, and people can come in, whether you are Muslim or whether you are non-Muslim, to understand about the concept of Islam. So the, the, the idea of power is still there, but it is under the level of more pers persuading or more persuasion people understand about Islam. So this is how we need to look back on how we interpret the level of power. So if you look into prison, for instance, uh, we have one prison here in Malaysia, I think Pudu prison, but it's being demolished now. And I think in many countries, they also have prison. Prison also showcase this idea of power. But the idea of power showcasing is more on the idea of coercion. It's trying to co coerce people. It's trying to control people because it's a prison. You know, you have inmates and things like that, and you need to monitor every cell. So Prison also have a certain level of power, but it is more on coercion level. And if you read book by Michael Foucault talking about the Panopticon, how the old traditional prison was designed, the adaptation up until now, it also used the same concept of power. So this 
in in many buildings power arises but how does we as designer interpret power into society so that that is the big question i think uh, all of us need need to understand that as, as designers and also as political leaders so i hope that answer your question prof sam oh <laughs> uh, you did prof alice thank you very much yep okay all right uh actually we have a, a question from uh uh from navin from navin to uh from nuvi so uh, hello ma'am, uh, could you briefly explain about the services within the temples, such as water pond and etc. How important it is, uh, how, how important is the temple pond to users and why are not many temples built near the river? And again, how Agra, Agra Haram and Shatinat houses provided water systems that connects directly to the services, to the service parts of houses? Or are they using the courtyard area for rainwater harvesting purposes? Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, in terms of the temple ponds, uh, okay, temple tanks. Uh, so, of course, they, uh, these temple towns were developed as a result of uh, ag agrarian expansion, agricultural expansion, everything. But then the temples um, were not exactly right next to the uh, rivers. So they needed the temple tanks for the of course, service part of it. Along with it, they also played a role in terms uh, in terms of um, uh, collective uh, interaction spaces or uh, having some rituals happening. Also, the temple rituals to happen, they needed that as well. So that was the uh, requirement of uh, temple tanks. And um, along in case of agra agraharams, uh, yes, they had wells in the backyards. Uh, from which they would uh, utilize uh, uh, water. Each house had wells. In some cases, they had uh, combined uh, wells also because the backyards were connected as well. Uh, so this was a scenario. And in terms of courtyards, uh, yes, like because of the slow proofing system and everything, they were able to collect some water. Uh, that, that was the scenario. I hope I answered the question. Uh, did I miss anything? Okay, uh, I hope that answers the question, Navin. All right, I think uh, that's it for our Q and A session. Uh, we are we have already reached the time given, so allow me to summarize the content of our speakers today. So, speaker number one, uh, with the title "Cultural Expression in Architecture Within Tamil Nadu Context," it is about the blending of rich culture in Tamil Nadu with architecture. Uh, let's it carry the identity of people and place. Standing in the test of time while some of the spaces shown to have been modified for newer users, the core character like the usage of streets around the temple and the rituals or the reincarnations of the components like verandas and courtyards as interactive spaces which still continue to exist. Appropriate uh, incorporation of culture, lifestyle and changing needs uh, with architecture created a more beneficial and intimate social setting for the people now and the future. And for speaker number two, with the title Contestation of Power in Architecture for the Search of Malaysian National Identity, national identity must be well interpreted as outlined by National Architecture Identity Policy, DASIC, which otherwise the architectural purpose and function tend to symbolize and showcase power and authority of the patron or designer. Thus, there is a need for uh, the designers and scholars to have clear awareness and understanding on national identity, role and purpose and function for the future development in shaping Malaysia built environment. And speaker number three, rethinking architecture and urbanism through public space in West Kalimantan, Indonesia. Uh, the city is physical built environment that plan and design. It also clarifies interrelationship of city, architecture, urban planning and urban design. The development and dynamism of cities cannot be avoided due to various factors such as growing population and growing economy. The role of architecture in urban scope will clearly make a significant contribution either directly or indirectly in shaping the face of the city and the problems that surround it. Also, the emergence of new values, especially in the dawn of the pandemic situation that we faced recently, becomes a new important component in design process, especially in public architecture or public space. All right, so that's the takeaway from uh, our speakers today. Uh, now I would like to ask all of the attendees uh, to open your cameras as I would like to take the screenshot of um, 
of our session today to commemorate uh, the webinar series number two. So please don't be shy. Uh, thank you very much. Please open your camera and I need to take the screenshot. Okay, please don't be shy. Open your camera. Just one or two screenshots and uh, we'll be done with it. Okay. I can see a lot of handsome faces and pretty faces here. We have audiences from uh, India and uh, Indonesia as well. All right. Uh, okay, we have a lot of participants. Okay, so I'm going to take um, a screenshot for a bit. Okay. Okay. S please smile. One, two, and three. All right. I need to save this first. Okay, and uh, next one, uh, please smile. One, two, and three. Thank you. And last one. One, two, and three. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for attending uh, uh, webinar series number two. Now we have come to the end of our session. Thank you again to our speakers, uh, Prof. Nivi, Associate Professor Dr. Alice Sabrina and uh, Professor Afril. Thank you also to the audience. It was a pleasure to have you all with us. So this concludes the webinar series number two. We from UTM hoping that our collaboration doesn't end here uh, with SASI and uh, Universitas Tanjung Pura. So thank you, for, thank you all for attending. Uh, we hope you have a good day ahead of you and uh, goodbye for now. Thank you. And please Thank make sure you, you please make sure you fill in the attendance uh, in the chat box section. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank